speaker of today is Sarah Gray from PAPS University, and her title is The Dynamics of non strictly Convex Hilbert Geometries. Thank you. Um, thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, and thank you, yes, for sticking around. Last talk of the day. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is a little, it's slightly tangential, but still connected to the conference in some ways. Um, for one, I'm bringing. I'm boldly bringing up dynamics, um, and this other world called Hilbert geometries. And a Hilbert geometry is really a, a special case of what is called a Finster geometry, which is uh, the, the natural generalization, natural in some sense, generalization of the Ramanian world that we all know and love really, really well. So. You have your Ramanian world, Ramanian matrix. I might do that. Ramanian world. And this lives inside a Finsa world. Where really that just wants to say, okay, you, you're granted a field of orange, you're granted uh, a, a metric, you're granted a norm on each tangent space. But you are not necessarily gifted with an inner product or quadratic form. When you are, this is precisely when you are in the Romanian case. Um, so, uh, in particular, an example that, I'll, that I study of insular geometries is convex real projective structures. So, a closed Definition closed and a manifold admits this kind of structure convex. So let's call it M admits the convex field projective structure. If there's a representation of the fundamental group of our closed manifold. Say it's n-dimensional, so we can represent it injected into uh, PGL n plus one R, um, the group of projective transformations, and in such a way that the universal cover of n after you tile, after you, you look at all its orbits under its this representation, um, is so let's yeah, all right, right, right. Such that this universal cover omega is a properly convex open set in projective space. because I've probably read it 40 times. Okay. This is the huge general thing that I'm talking about today in a specific context. Um, and uh, from here, uh, maybe many of you haven't heard of this stuff before, so I'd like to kind of give you a good taste for it. I'd like to give you a taste for the type of dynamics I do. And in particular, the non-uniform hyperbolic issues that I have to deal with, how I address them, and then how this kind of fits as a generalization of Ramanian geometry in sometimes a tricky and sometimes really beautiful and interesting way. So let's make more sense. of what this omega thing is. So how should we think? Think about something that lives in projective space. Think about it again. Um, so identify RPN with RP R n plus one minus a point. Minus the origin. 
and think about omega as this cone, as a space of lines, right? So we can take this cone, or you could take a positive cone. So maybe we're in R3, and let's look at the cone over the ellipse, perhaps. Um, so this, this cone is an n plus 1 dimensional thing. That's already more dimensions than we're ready to handle, me at least. But we can represent it with an affine slice. And this, in this affine slice, it's an n-dimensional Euclidean object. It's endowed with this structure that we can use <coughs> to construct an affometric. So we represent Um, so, let's, we, um, so in this sense, in this world, we understand notions of convexity, right? We understand, we can also define proper convexity. So convex, normal, usual notion. And by properly convex, I just mean that you can choose an affine slice And this is an ability can choose an affine slice of the cone such that omega is lives as a bounded set, a bounded domain in that set, in that slice. Okay. So in particular, if you looked at the complement to this cone, that is not properly convex because you could never take an affine slice in which it is bounded. So this is a good omega. We're interested in studying it. And why do we want this property? Because all such properly convex open sets admit a Hilbert geometry, or a Hilbert metric. Originally constructed by Hilbert back in his day as a solution to his fourth problem, finding spaces where lines are geodesic. Um, let's see why it works like that. Okay, so what is a Hilbert metric? So now we have our affine chart for omega, and it has Euclidean coordinates. So let's take omega out and paste it on the board. Here's omega. Now it's two dimensions, and it's nice. Um, so we define the Hilbert metric. D omega. For any two points, x and y and omega, we can draw the Euclidean line through them, take its intersection with the boundary, and then take the cross ratio of those four points. D of x y. And then we take the logarithm of that, <coughs> scale it, and we get a distance. The cross ratio is you take the big distances, so a y, let's write it down. So the Euclidean distance, because we are granted that here, over the small distances. So this is another big distance times bx over by. And this gives you something that's always bigger than one, notably, and will give you a well-defined distance. And what sort of stuff is this going to do to our omega? Well, clearly lines are geodesic. They're realizing the minimum distance. Also, what if I took y and I started marching it off to infinity? Then by is getting really, really small. Ay and bx are staying the same. Ay is getting bigger, only so much bigger, but this is going to blow up the cross ratio to infinity. So the boundary, remember omega is open, and the closure of, of omega is really metrically at infinity in the sense that we would want it to be. <coughs> well, uh, why is this metric independent from the choice of the affine chart? Because the, the cross ratio is uh, projectively invariant and okay. affinely, yes. So great, great point. Um, it is a beautiful fact in projective geometry that the cross ratio of four lines is well defined. So that means that if you take these four lines and take the cross ratio of these four points, it's the same as the cross ratio of these four points. 
So you could take any affine slice for omega, and this metric would be one. Other questions? Yeah. Um, all right, so example. Everyone's favorite first example. Of course, hyperbolic space. As a is a, going to be an example of Finsler geometry. If you take the ellipse like I just did, and you put the Hilbert metric on it, then what you get back is precisely the hyperbolic metric. disk model. Lines are geodesic in this case. But this is the, the Finster norm is Riemannian. So we have a notion of angle, but in this case it's just that angles are distorted from the ones you would see in the Poincaré disk model. And in fact, this is the only case when the Finster norm is Riemannian. Um, another example. On the complete opposite extreme, we could take the projective triangle and put the Hilbert metric on it. Um, oh, actually, maybe I'll say here. This is also our first example of what is called a divisible Hilbert geometry. So, definition. We say uh, Hilbert geometry is divisible uh, precisely when there exists a discrete subgroup gamma of projective transformations which preserves omega and such that the quotient omega mod gamma is compact. So, of course, this is, the ellipse is an example of a divisible Hilbert geometry. We know plenty of examples of hyperbolic manifolds. Um, for example, we could look at uh, the modular group, which has been a, fun to a hot topic this, this week. Uh, you could take, a, you could take a hyperbolic isometry, or sorry, uh, you could generate your, you could represent, basically, you represent PSL 2Z in PGL 3R. And you, you would put the order 2 rotation there, the 6 one there, and then uh, this will correspond to a parabolic element. And they behave the same way that they would behave in uh, the the Poincaré disk, for example, like this parabolic group element acts by translation along ellipses. And it leaves this a hyperplane at infinity invariant. It actually acts by translation along. Uh, and hyperbolic isometries similarly will act by translation along lines. So angles are different, but it's really the same notion. Uh, example two, another Hilbert geom divisible Hilbert geometry is the triangle. So let's first think about the triangle as this first quadrant in R3. Maybe this guy here. 
So it's this cone coming, or first octant, it's the cone coming out of the board. And we take this affine slice generated by the basis vectors, one, 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 zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one. And what happens if we picked some matrix like this guy? We'll choose it in PSL because why not? So this is its representation in SL. And what if we acted on this guy with this matrix? Well, it's going to, um, in the first, for example, in the XZ plane, it's acting by scaling. Let's take one. It's acting by scaling in this direction. The x-axis is like an attractor. Okay. And similarly, on the y-x-axis. But on the y-z-axis, this is projectively a tie. This is projectively the identity. Because, we can write it out, but what is this going to do to something that looks like 0, y, z? This is 1 over lambda times 0, y, z, which is projectively the same as 0, y, z. So it was the identity on this axis. So it fixes point-wise all of these guys. And it will scale, it will push these lines towards x. Oh, maybe I'll make this color. So this guy, maybe g, is acting by translation along these lines towards x. And similarly, we could take another matrix, maybe h, with three distinct eigenvalues, lambda, u, and or something like that, where they're not equal. Maybe they're ordered like this. And in this case, it won't actually be translating along lines because it will push, uh, if they're ordered like this, then the z-axis is always an attractor. And the y-axis is an attractor over the x-axis. So if you look at some generic point in here, it's getting pushed like this. So these are the invariant curves under this type of action. But mm, how can I draw this nicely? <laughs> yes. But regardless, you see a group action that's commutative. It's generated by two diagonal matrices. Uh, this guy will take the green lines to the green lines, and the green guy will take the purple lines to the purple lines. So what you end up with is a tiling, a Z2 tiling with quotient a torus. You can see that okay. But this is a, a, a fundamental domain for the action. So here's another really explicit example of the divisible of the geometry. That's also very important. And also at a very different extreme from the ellipsoid. I mean, for one, it admits a Z2 action that's very not hyperbolic. Um, furthermore, uh, Dillahard first noticed back in the 60s or 70s that in fact, the triangle is isometric to, with this metric, isometric to R2 with a hexagon norm. And what is this space? Uh, R2 with a hexagon norm is, or you could take any convex norm really, and d decide, or any convex body, sorry, and decide for that to be your unit ball in Rn. Sure, why not? So what that means is every, 
vector pointing to that convex, to the hull of that convex body, is a unit vector. So these are all unit vectors in this norm. And then how would you find that norm, for example? You just scale the hexagon, and whatever that scaling is, that's the norm of your vector. So this is maybe lambda hexagon. That implies norm B. Um, and how can we start to see why the, the triangle should be Euclidean? Well, the, I think the best way to see it really is just using this beautiful property of the cross ratio of four lines. So in this metric, say, let's look at two lines that go into a vertex. By this property, these distances are the same all the way to the vertex. Those distances are actually the same even though it looks like it's getting smaller. So we're looking at it in this model is a little misleading because really what the metric does is it takes this vertex here and blows it up to infinity. So you could think of these distances as like these. So these correspond to parallel lines in this model. But it's a little funky still. This is not uh, your conventional Euclidean model, but it's Euclidean. It's, it's, sorry, it's not your conventional Euclidean model, but it's flat in a sense nonetheless. Okay. So, now I'm gonna, oh, also I should of course mention that it was Benoit who first introduced for a long time, actually, it was thought that this was it. That Benzikri conjectured that really there was nothing between these two examples for Hilbert geometry, divisible Hilbert geometries. And Benoit constructed numerous non trivial examples in non trivial examples in automorphisms of convex guns. This is actually in French. Um, so thinking about it in the moduli space, if you like, or in the deformation space of real projective structures, you could take the ellipse, you could take a, a compact hyperbolic model whose lift is the ellipse, and you could deform that structure slightly and get some and, and break the Ramanian structure and get numerous examples of Finsler structures on these on these spaces that we conventionally thought of in, in taking other space with the Ramanian metrics. So there's a, a huge big world in which Teichmuller sits in a, a very interesting way. Um, okay. Anyways, so now a little about dynamics. Aside, dynamics. <laughs> oh, welcome to my world. Um, so it's interesting to think about how how those structures and those deformations kind of sit on a spectrum. Which ones are, are, are those examples hyperbolic in a sense? How do we arrange the hyperbolicity? What, does, what can we say about them? How can we quantify that? Um, so Benoit first noted, this is his first paper on convex divisible sets. So he noted convex divisibles one, C1. Uh, he noted a very strong dichotomy between the strictly convex and non-strictly convex examples. So, I'll write it here. Uh, from now on, I'm always assuming divisible PCOS, divisible properly convex. Um, so if I don't write it, it's, it's there in, in heart. It's all in our heads. Um, and oh, M equals omega by gamma, the usual. Um, so we have this omega being strictly convex. So it has no lines in the boundary properly. There's no line segments in the boundary, not strictly convex as this. 
um, if and only if, this is, sorry, this is the following R equivalent. Um, it's strictly convex if and only if the boundary is C1. If and only if the, metric, the group is delta hyperbolic. And if and only if we have a nice condition for the geodesic flow. So I will write this all down momentarily. But first introduction to the geodesic flow, if you have not met it yet, it is a flow. This is a flow on the, the unit tangent bundle to a manifold. So I denote T1M, the unit tangent bundle. Okay. Um, denoted phi t, a one parameter family of maps, continuous maps, which definition by picture yet again. Sorry, I hope that's close, you guys. Um, we define phi t of v to be pushing v along the geodesic line generated by it, in particular the line, pushing v forward time t. So, this is pushing the uh, unit speed along it, the geodesic line that it generates. Okay? Definition made picture. So it's flow along lines at unit speed. This is unit sensor speed, by the way. Sensor. Albert. And we are, so we see here that there's a strong relationship between strict convexity and hyperbolicity of the group and the metric. And the dynamics also play a crucial role in this. He also shows that this is equivalent to the flow being a Nossov. And by a Nossov, I will define it basically to be a very strong hyperbolicity property. Um, we won't talk about it, we won't work with it too much today, but um, this basically means that the tangent space at every point to the phase space decomposes into exponentially expanding and contracting directions and a flow direction. So exponentially expanding and exponentially contracting. This is a really strong and beautiful classical property of the geodesic flow and hyperbolic spaces. Uh, just a question. In mm -hmm. dimension two, mm -hmm. for a convex, uh, convex structure, a real convex structure on, on first phase, uh, is it equivalent for the boundary of omega 3 C1 on the metric to be hyperbolic? Uh, it's. Uh, are you saying like leave the divisible property? Or. Okay, take. Uh, Take, take uh, like this, maybe? a projective, a real projective convex structure on a surface, mm -hmm. a very closed surface, mm -hmm. and so you have the developing map which only to a set omega. Okay. And yeah. So that has to. If it's, it's either, um, it will either admit the triangle is a universal cover or something strictly convex. This is for surfaces. Okay. It will. Yeah. There's, there's nothing in between like, like this. This is not going to be the universal cover of something. Because there's a, the admitting a group action it, it ensures a lot of symmetry of your universal cover in your space. Um, so these guys, which are strictly convex, but they're not C1, for example, they are not allowed. And that sort of, and yeah. The, as soon as, also, as soon as you have a line in the boundary, you see a, a lack of hyperbolicity behavior in the metric. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at uh, these distances, this distance at infinity is defined. There, there are four collinear points, and there's a cross ratio there. So if you look at these distances as you go to infinity, they're bounded, even though these points don't meet at infinity. That is some sort of parallelism that you don't want to see in the. Uh, you could make that even more explicit. If you look at uh, these triangles, these are fat triangles. So like a triangle that goes up to infinity like this. These are not delta. Um, okay, 
So this is a non-set, which is a hypervelocity property of the flow, hypervelocity property. And when we have the delta hypervelocity of the group, and we have all these properties, Benoit concludes that these are really all equivalent hypervelocity, strict convexity, regularity of the boundary. Um, so what if we wanted to study a range? Like I said before, we are, are in this Finster space. We can deform these re real projective convex structures. And we want to know when they're more or less hyperbolic than the others. I mean, one way you could do that is to study the, the delta and delta hypervelocity, which uh, has been studied by Constantin Galikos and Derevik and Kobwa. Um, another great way to do it is using the dynamics. And in particular, um, you could study a classical dynamical invariant called entropy, which is colloquially understood to mean chaos, and in some sense it is. So entropy, or topological entropy, of a system, the idea is it measures the amount of information you need to predict your system up to a certain time, and then takes that limit as infinity. So you have, uh, you predict how, how much or how hard is it to predict your system at scale epsilon up to time n. So you quantify that, you take the limit as n goes to infinity, and you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And this describes the topological uh, complexity of your system in a way. And uh, this turns out to be a really great way to describe the, also the hyperbolic complexity of our, si our strictly convex examples, in a, in a sense. So Crampon first showed, Crampon was kind of that it is true that as soon as you leave the Ramanian world, then you also lose hypervelocity in some sort of sense. You lose entropy. We have that, let's call this H top, topological entropy. Um, H top for strictly convex omega. H top is bounded, if this is for the flow, by the way. Bounded by n minus 1, where n is the dimension, with equality only in the Ramanian case. Precisely in the Ramanian case and only in the Ramanian case. Only if omega is the ellipsoid. Um, so this is. Uh, one way of seeing how leaving the Ramanian world really does distort the entropy in a way. And Ni took this further when he showed that you really can achieve the full range of entropy in this world of real projective structures. So he showed that H top is continuous and surjective. Onto zero and minus one on the, the as a map from the space of real projective structures into the real numbers. Um, and what he did is he he took these uh, he took this Ramanian case, the the hyperbolic case, took a a little or orbital fold sitting inside of it, and deformed this guy in a one parameter family of values. And as you deform it, it becomes more and more polygonal at the extremes. 
It's still strictly convex, but it looks more and more like some sort of funky polygon. And as it gets more polygonal, you lose entropy. So you can really, and this is in both ways that we deformed it. So you can really attain all extremes of entropy. Okay. So, cool, I guess. Interesting, right? Now what am I doing here? Um, so my, question, my question is what about the non-strictly convex case? Uh, so now what I want to do is introduce an interesting example of Benoit. Um, well, of, of course, the triangle is an example of a non-strictly convex case, and it's, it's a trivial example. It's Euclidean, and it has no entropy. But I want to introduce an, introduce an interesting example that has obstructions to hyperbolicity, but obstructions that we believe are surmountable. And I will provide some, some proofs and some short ideas for why they should be surmountable and how we kind of think about these, these objects and deal with those obstructions <coughs> geometrically when we don't have nice things like inner products and we don't have uh, a lot of the structure that you that we are typically gifted with in this, even the strictly convex case. Okay, so what is this magic example? So first, that, in dimension two, non strictly convex implies n divisible implies that omega is a triangle. Okay. Um, how about in dimension three? So it was also thought for a while that there were only strictly convex cases and polytopes. And then Benoit constructed an example in his fourth paper, convex divisible four. Uh, if you look at omega in RP3, you assume it is because divisible usual, um, irreducible. Well, assume that it's not a polytope and not an ellipsoid, and not H3. Then you have an extraordinary amount of geometry. So there exist countably many triangles properly embedded. I'll call them del triangle. Properly embedded in omega, meaning so let's call this PET. So that means that the triangle, the open triangle interior, lives inside omega, and its boundary is embedded in the boundary of omega. So think of it as like omega has a half of a 3D Dorito puffing out at these triangles. So it has this triangle in its boundary, but kind of like puffs out at the triangle. Um, the, the triangles are disjoint. In the closure, mm -hmm. so that means they don't even meet at infinity. But their vertices are dense at infinity. everywhere. And you get this crazy fractal-like picture. Uh, they're isolated in the interior. And the quotient has a JSJ decomposition, like we've seen before, such that the triangles that we see everywhere in the universal cover project to tori and Klein bottles in the quotient, as we might expect. See, 
So we get this thing uh, in the quotient. We have these finite or many. Did I mention that? <coughs> Two. And number of tori and climb models in the quotient. And what group do you consider? Which group? Yeah, yeah, which group. Yeah. Uh, it's which is in which or which? We, uh, which? No, no, no. This uh, gun. Yes. Yeah, this, this is, is so. It? This is actually completely general. But he has. This is. Uh, you assume those conditions, and this will be the case. There will be a gamma. But um, he has examples uh, where he takes polygons and acts on them by Coxeter groups, mm -hmm. and they will tile an omega like this. And you can take a subgroup of that Coxeter group to get a manifold in the quotient. So some subgroups of coxeter groups. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, you guys know what the JSJ composition looks like. I've drawn it plenty of times, but these kind of three manifold pieces with tori boundary components. Okay. So. This has a lot of promise for hyperbolicity, right? Or some sort of partial hyperbolicity. We have these flat chunks, but they're a lower dimension. Maybe we can work with that. But they are, they are some pretty serious obstructions. First and foremost, um, one thing that we're going to lose immediately when we have these tori in the quotient, or the triangles in the universal cover, is some of the exponential contra contraction and expansion that we see in a typical dynamical system. So if you're in H2 with the projective metric, with the Hilbert metric, uh, and you look at how these, how these geodesic lines meet at infinity, and you look at these distances, these distances are going to zero exponentially in positive time and in negative time. So if you look, if you orient these lines, go at unit speed, this is xn, yn, then the distance from xn, yn is going to zero exponentially. And goes to x infinity. And it goes to infinity as n goes to minus infinity. What happens in a triangle? Well, we've seen already, if you're walking in and out of a vertex, this is constant. These are parallel. So immediately, this sort of idea is breaking. And then what happens if you look at maybe Maybe two lines that meet at infinity like this. And you orient them this way. And you parameterize them at unit speed. And you ask, how are these distances changing? So these are actually converging exponentially fast. <laughs> uh, this is maybe a computation, but we won't do it. But they're getting really, really close. But if you look at the opposite direction, and you go to negative time, and you look at these distances, now they're bounded, we saw before. So this stuff is breaking in a very bizarre, non-uniform way. So how are we going to deal with this? Oh, uh, another thing I wanted to mention is because of things like this, um, no analysis of property. In particular, this has a pretty major consequence in that Crampon's inequality depends heavily on the Anasov property. He uses that to prove his inequality. So, bound for topological entropy is still, this is what we're looking for, right? We need to find, there's plenty of reasons that it should be the same bound, but we can't 
prove it with conventional techniques because we lose this property that's really strong. for the strictly convex case. And in fact, we will have that also for these guys. density of the group in SL2. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, that's a great thing. So now how do we prove just topological transitivity? We're going to use a nice lemma that periodic points of the flow are dense in the phase space, which is the unit tangent bundle. So now what we do is we use the geometry and we play the orbit gluing game. Okay. 
Okay, so we've got our two open sets, U and V, and T1M. And we have density of periodic points, so periodic orbits. So I, sh sorry, I should say periodic orbits, but it doesn't matter. So there's some periodic orbit that eventually hangs out with U. So let's call U, little u, a point in U, which is periodic under the flow. And then there's going to be another guy who crosses V. So little v. And the important observation is that if we go upstairs, uh, or downstairs, up, upstairs in the universal cover, the periodic points under the flow correspond precisely to group elements which preserve lines. The flow is falling along lines, right? So if you go upstairs into omega, so let's just look at omega though, not the tangent bundle, then u corresponds to some lift. And if u is periodic, then the line determined by u is left invariant by some hyperbolic group element. There's some g, which acts by translation along this axis. Let's call this g minus and g plus. Similarly for d tilde. Okay, 
Let's just take a smaller open U. The tori are closed. They'll be closed in the, the tangent space them will be closed too. So take some U prime or N V prime such that they do not intersect. They don't intersect the tangent space to a tori or column of tori. And then play orbitally again. Now you have strict convexity where you need it, and you have the exponential convergence where you need it. So this is just one example where the geometry of the space makes up for a lot of the lack of regularity that we see with these tori, and gives us evidence that I think the hyperbolicity components uh, really will push the flow in a, in a really positive and interesting direction. So some of the next questions are, what can we say about the topological entropy? And maybe we could approach this from using the geometry from a measure theoretic perspective, using the ergodic theory of the space. And uh, this is where I'm headed next. Thanks for your time. Three manifolds that meet such a structure of uh, strictly convex or uh, non strictly convex? The non strictly convex? Yeah, so the, the ones with the JSJD composition. The JG composition with hyperbolic. Mm -hmm, with the hyperbolic but composition. But the effect manifolds don't mean this. So it's There's actually not a lot known about the ah, not three not manifold known. theory of these guys and how, yeah, how you can deform the deformation spaces. Uh, definitely a hot topic right now. So we thank you again. Tomorrow we will start with ten and twelve. Well, that's mean, uh, the, uh, uh, well, that you mean, uh, the, 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 uh, the